So now that you know a little bit about what a worker thread does, basically it gets, it can get work from the shared queue for non-fork join client tasks, non-fork join task clients rather, and then as it starts to run, it runs compute methods and they can go ahead and fork and join. Now we're gonna talk about the thing that really makes the framework magic, and that's work stealing, which is one of my favorite topics. So, and this kind of goes back to, to Gavin's question, although we'll see in a second, it's, it's a very deep and fascinating topic. So worker threads are going to try not to block. Remember the whole point was to not block. We never want them to stop, if at all possible. They will only block if there is absolutely no work left to do at all. And this again motivates why we have a common fork join pool, because the idea is to keep dumping work into that common pool so that these threads don't have to stop. Because it turns out stopping threads is expensive. Blocking threads or stopping threads, blocking cores, stopping cores is very expensive on modern multi-core processors. Because it takes a while to start them up again. That's the whole thing. It's like um, it's like a production run. If you're a book publisher or whatever, you know, you set up a run and you try to estimate how many books do we need, and you print the books, and then later you come back and you're like, ah, oh, we need more books. Well, that takes a while to get the run back up again. So you want to try to keep things as busy as possible. So therefore, when a worker thread goes to check its deck, its work queue, and it finds its work Q empty, like the, the thread here in the middle does, it will check other decks in the pool to try to see if they have work that they're not working on that it can steal. And uh, as we'll see, it's, it's going to do this in a random way. It randomly checks these, these decks to try to avoid always going to the same place and having lots of contention. Now, here's the interesting part, and this goes back to why things don't wait too long at the end of, of these decks. To maximize the core utilization, idle threads will steal work from the tail of other threads that are busy and haven't cleared out their deck yet. It'll steal from the tail of the busy threads decks. So as you can see, remember we push and pop from the front of the deck but when we don't have anything else to do, we go ahead and we steal from the end of the deck. So that addresses several things. First, it, it is how things don't get neglected for too long, because if they get stuck at the end of the deck, then someone else will come along and steal them when they don't have anything else to do. Um, and there's another reason for doing this as well, which we'll talk about in a second. The first thing to note is that the, the deck that's stolen from is randomly selected, so we don't preordained. You don't always say, start with the first deck and steal from that one. Because if you did, all these threads would be converging on that deck, and then you'd have contention, which would lead to additional overhead. Tasks are stolen in FIFO order. So remember that the thread will put things at the, um, let's see, best way to think of this. Um, you, you put things at the so this is looking at it from the point of view of, of the deck as a queue, not the deck as a stack, right? So you're going to, when you push something on the stack, you're going to end queue it at the front, but then it gets stolen. I, I guess I should switch this around. This should really say, you know, push and then pull, and this is actually the end. So, but if you think about it, this is a queue. We're taking things off of the front of the queue, which is actually the end of the deck. <laughs> kind of weird. That's basically the idea. So you're always stolen in FIFO order. So the things that are put on first will be stolen first, whereas things that are pushed and popped, it'll be in life order. It'll be the reverse of that. And the reason for doing this is to minimize contention with the thread, the worker thread, that owns the deck, because the thread that owns the deck will be pushing and popping to the front of the deck, and another thread will be trying to pull things off of the end of the queue. 
And so if all goes well and the queue has more than one element in it, then there's actually no contention at all. Because polling and pulling things off the end of the deck won't interfere with anything going on at the front of the deck. And that's because the front of the deck and the end of the deck are protected by two different sets of locking mechanisms. And so they don't actually contend for the same lock, which is, is really cool. Now, the other cool thing about stealing from the back is that the task that you're stealing typically has a larger unit of work. Why the heck would that be the case? That's because we typically, not always, but we typically use fork join pools in a situation where we start with a big region of data. And every time we fork, we split it in half. So remember when you fork, let's say you start out with an, um, an input array of size 100. And then you fork it into a left child and a right child. Each of those things will be 50. So you push those onto the stack. Then you, the worker thread, will pop one of those guys off, and you would further decompose it. So now you've got, you know, two things of 25 instead of, you, you have two things of 25, one thing of 50, and so you've got three things instead of two things of 50. And then you further take the things of 25 and you split those things. So the things that are at the front of the deck, the things that you're pushing and popping, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to some atomic size of, you know, one. And the things that are at the end of the deck are the bigger things. So when another thread comes around and steals something, it's going to steal the biggest thing. And once it steals the biggest thing, it will then start decomposing it. So what you end up doing is you end up taking big things and having other threads steal them, and they start breaking them up in their own threads. So when all is said and done, if you play your cards right, you end up with all the fork join pool threads working on elements that have been split up to their smallest pieces, and then they can all process those things in parallel. So it turns out to be a very, especially if you have data that splits evenly and efficiently, you can use this nice divide and conquer approach to disseminate all the different chunks of work to the worker threads in the pool that steal work that's big and they split it up. That's basically how it's going to do it. So you can, the, the fancy way of saying this is you can enable further recursive decomposition by having the stealing thread break things up, and it starts with a big thing to begin with. And that's yet another reason for stealing things at the end. So we're going to steal things at the end um, because we want to minimize locking overhead, and we're going to steal things at the end because chances are we're going to get big things that we can then chomp up into pieces in parallel with other processing that's taking place. The work queue deck that implements work stealing is carefully implemented to minimize locking contention. And in particular, here's a picture of this. Let's see. Um, so you could read this, this article. This is an article about work stealing deck that explains kind of the implementation of this. And you can see that you've got this data structure that pushes and pops onto the front. And then, as we'll see, it steals things at the end. So push and pop are only ever called by the owning worker thread. So they don't have to worry about any other thread contending for manipulating the deck from the front. They just have to worry about somebody stealing off the end. And those can be done carefully. The operations that are done to perform this are called compare and swap, or CAS operations, which are basically spin loops implemented in hardware. Very, very, very efficient. They never block, they never block so they're called weight-free. They never, they never wait. They just sit there and they spin on a memory location, waiting that memory location to be set to a particular value, in which case they will acquire exclusive access. So it's very, very fast. Even though it, it spins, it's a very efficient operation. And because there's little or no contention ever, it's super fast, super efficient. What poll is, poll is the method that's used to steal something off the end of the queue. And this is called by another worker thread to steal a subtask off the end of some other thread's deck. Remember, push and pop are only the owning threads but pull is called by another thread. And these may not be weight-free. Weight they, they may have to wait because 
of the way that things work. It may have some, a little bit of contention there. And you can read more about the behaviors of these things at this paper by Doug Lee, who wrote all this stuff. And it's super duper sophisticated and very, very cool. If you want to learn all the gory details about how fork join pool work stealing behaves, take a look at the comments in the fork join pool Java file, and they explain it in great detail. I, I don't expect you to know all the details, by the way. I won't ask you details of that. I won't ask you to like cite chapter and verse from those comments. But if you're really curious, it's quite interesting. I will expect you to know things like push and pop is always done by the owning thread. Pole is always called by, the, by another thread that's trying to steal. Those, those are the key things to know. You don't have to know all the implementation details. OK, so that's the overview of work stealing in a fork join pool. And that's really what gives it a lot of its power. And keep in mind, again, the whole purpose of doing this is to ensure maximal utilization.